So, uh, so what I thought, uh, so uh, much of my work focuses on uh, uh, cybersecurity, uh, cyber privacy issues, and uh, also intellectual property issues, uh, you know, patent policy, patent law, those are sort of my areas of expertise. So here, what I thought I would do in this talk is to tell you about some of the work that uh, uh, my group has been doing in cybersecurity, um, and um, I'll share with you um, um, three specific projects that uh, we've been working on. Um, and um, there are papers, there's all kinds of other stuff, and, and all that is available on SSRM. If, you, if you're not familiar with SSRM, you should be familiar with it because it's the best place to access uh, legal scholarship uh, in the United States. Virtually every professor uh, in the United States who does any law or policy will publish their papers on SSRN, Social Science Research Network, SSRN.com. Uh, so the, one of the very first things you should do, uh, you know, you, you obviously use Google Scholar or whatever else, but, but you should definitely, at least for the United States, um, for any kind of legal scholarship, you should go to SSRN.com. So, so they really, really do a good job uh, of making sure that all the papers are up there. So there are papers on all these topics, information sharing and cyber insurance and all these things. Uh, there are papers, uh, so you can go look uh, at very detailed analysis, economic modeling, data, all this kind of stuff. So I'm giving you a sort of a like, high level uh, uh, you know, overview of that stuff. Uh, so um, you know, uh, the first few slides are kind of to give you a little bit of context about where we are in the United States with respect to cyber security, where we find ourselves today, uh, and what issues uh, what kind of laws exist, etc. And then we'll talk about sort of cyber insurance, information sharing, and um, market for vulnerabilities. So, I mean, basically, one of the problems in this area is that uh, deterring cyber attacks is difficult. It's difficult because uh, the criminal laws are not very good. Uh, and uh, in addition, you have other problems like the fact that you might not get jurisdiction over the people who are doing all these bad acts and all those kinds of problems as well. Um, and that's related to the fact that um, you really cannot entirely accurately uh, pinpoint the source of the attacks. So you have an attribution problem. Uh, and you have an attribution problem because you might mistakenly think that some third parties who have been involved in the attack that is the actual source, but they're, they're not the actual source. That, you know, the, the actual source, source is somebody else. Uh, and, and, and of course, um, you know, deterrence because of rendering the attacks ineffective, uh, deterrence by denial, uh, it, it is really uh, you know, quite hard to do. And that then brings up the whole question of uh, can you engage in so-called active defense? Is that, is that actually OK? Uh, and, and what is that? It's the status of active defense? It's, it's a big legal question. In, in, in other words, um, am I allowed to hit back at you and disable your computer? But how do I know that you're actually the source? Uh, I'm disabling your computer, but in fact, your computer has been taken over by somebody else. Uh, so, uh, so, so exactly how do I uh, trace back, and how do I route back, and how do I send the packets back? and so on. So there's a, so there's a sort of whole issue with respect to deterring attacks. Uh, the, the, the other big issue, of course, is that there is, in fact, when you look at the fallout from these attacks, there is um, you know, a large number of uh, these attacks that have taken place. And I'm just simply giving you a little list of them. Um, uh, I will uh, send the slides to Indranath so you can uh, take a closer look at the content on these slides. I'm not going to spend my time going through every one of them. I hate people who read slides uh, in a talk. It's just you know, uh, I can read myself. I don't need to say those things. Uh, so uh, so um, the, the issue here really is, is identity theft. And, and that is that you know, all, all of these big uh, health service providers, financial service providers, um, um, consumer products uh, companies, all of them have a lot of information about all of us uh, and, uh, and what our shopping practices are and what our um, credit card information and all of this stuff. And so they are like favorite targets uh, for uh, cyber attacks. Um, and so that you, know, you can basically you know, get identity theft, to spoof your information, and so on. So one of the big areas in the US, one of the big 
um, solutions is um, that there are a lot of laws that have been passed that require private companies to inform citizens when they have suffered a data breach. Okay? Uh, and, and so, in, in other words, if I am, uh, uh, say, JP Morgan Chase, the bank, and if my computer systems have been compromised and you have an account, then the company is obligated to inform you that your information may have been taken by somebody else. So then you can do whatever you want to do, right? Uh, so, uh, so, so, so these da data breach laws exist. The problem with these data breach laws, even though you can see 47 states and, uh, and the District of Columbia have these laws, uh, part of the problem is that what is the trigger for triggering notification? Okay? Uh, under what conditions do they need to tell you that they have uh, uh, suffered a data breach? That's the first thing. And the second thing is what exactly is your remedy? Is it simply that you need to be notified? Do you actually get to sue them? Is there a cause of action? Uh, do you actually get to say, hey, you know, I've suffered a problem, some damage because of that? Uh, do I actually get to sort of do the compensation? So that's a big issue. Uh, and, and, you know, I just simply picked this, uh, since I live in Illinois, I picked the Illinois example. But it turns out that, you know, in Illinois, the, the laws are very narrowly written. They're written uh, narrowly so because, because most of these private companies don't want to give you notification. Right? They don't want you to get scared. They don't. You know, they, they want to keep hush it all up, and, and, and you know, so on and so forth. And so, so they come up with really elaborate um, things like, oh, was your social security number taken? Uh, was was the identification number of something taken? You know, all this kind of stuff. And, uh, so, so the idea is, oh, but that was not taken. But we store that in a separate computer. So, so that was not compromised. So that's sort of thing. Um, in addition, actually, it turns out that. Um, there's lots and lots of inadvertent disclosures of, of lots of these things. Uh, so just as an example, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the Chicago Public Schools, they sent, the, uh, uh, you know, they sent basically social security numbers for 1,700 uh, former employees to everybody. And, and so, so then what happens? You know, you know, so, so, so this sort of stuff. Uh, and and you know, some of this stuff can be really, really bad. Uh, it's it's really uh, I mean you, you you know you guys may not probably have um, these kinds of problems uh, in India yet at least maybe it's not things that I've heard of yet uh, but but you know this is a particularly egregious example of this uh, poor lady um, you know Amy Lynn Boyer uh, who was uh, being stalked by this uh, person uh, who who, who um, uh, and ultimately he killed her and killed himself <laughs> you know so this is a sort of uh, um, you know, I'm pretty serious, and he got the information. She had deliberately sort of tried to kind of get away, and, and he managed to get all this information uh, about her um, from this company called DocuSearch. Uh, so, so I mean, so things are pretty, uh, things are pretty, pretty bad. Uh, and in addition, the Federal Trade Commission uh, has um, a number of uh, decisions and consent decrees and so on. Um, trying to police private companies uh, that claim to have certain policies in place, but in fact they don't. <laughs> okay, uh, so so they're largely policing privacy policies and security policies. In other words, you're you're saying you've done all these things, uh, but in fact you're not. A good example of this was a few months ago with Snapchat. Uh, so Snapchat basically one of their big selling points was uh, that of course, hey, I send this stuff to you, and it's truly temporary. It's truly temporary, and nobody gets to sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, keep records. It turns out it's not quite true because if I send, and you know, of course, a lot of the kids, uh, you know, think it's so cool, nobody's storing anything, so it's on, and then they Snapchat away, uh, right? Uh, but, but it turns out that yes, if I can send a image through Snapchat to you, that's true. Snapchat may not store it. That may be true, but you might store it. And you're allowed to store it. And, and, and by the way, if you access uh, the information through saying, I send you stuff by Snapchat, and you use Instagram to access the photo, and that's because that's what you use, and then you can do even more things with it. And you can cut, crop, do whatever you want. And so, uh, so, uh, so, so basically, uh, the FTC went and said, hey, listen, use Snapchat, stop saying all these things. 
and stop saying things that these are really set temporary and all this kind of stuff. These are all sort of very heavily misleading statements. So this is largely where we find ourselves in the United States. Find a lot of these attacks, there's all these data breach laws, there are these FTC rules and so on. But still, you know, the reality is that uh, we have a long way to go. So one of the areas, uh, if we really cannot use um, you know, various kinds of laws and policies to, uh, to achieve deterrence in, uh, in this kind of environment, uh, the question becomes, are there private sector initiatives uh, that uh, you know, we ought to at least consider over and above what laws and policies mean? Uh, is, there, is there things that we can do to try to incentivize uh, private companies uh, to, to improve um, information security? Right? And that's, that's really what uh, the cyber insurance project tries to do. And so you, you can take a look at the economic modeling and so on to try to see how that works. But the basic point here is that there's a lot of uh, uh, interest in trying to use cyber insurance as a way to sort of have a more secure uh, data environment. Uh, and, and this is at the highest levels. People who looked at it have sort of said, hey, listen, uh, this is um, a really a cool thing uh, that's worth doing. Um, and in addition, the most recently, about a couple of months ago, uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US has released a sort of a framework uh, that a private companies can follow um, uh, to try to sort of, hey, uh, if I have a cybersecurity plan in place within the company, how should I sort of develop the plan, what should I focus on, uh, and so on. And that's what the NIST framework tries to do, and it has these five functions, identify, identify you know, problem areas, um, what, what do you do to protect yourself, how do you detect uh, a problem, how do you respond, and then how do you recover. Uh, so, so use your cyber security um, uh, infrastructure to try to address these five functions uh, in, in within your company. Uh, and, and, and part of this also includes, of course, uh, when, you, when you're talking about an insurance company, and an insurance company wants to sort of give you an insurance policy to protect yourself against uh, cyber attacks, they're interested in what you're doing. But because are you basically a person who is high risk? Are you low risk? Are you uh, what exactly uh, is the premiums that you have to be charged? What is the amount of exclusion? So on and so forth. Because they want, they obviously are not in the business of, um, and, you know, if they have to make massive payouts, then they want to stop offering cyber insurance, right? <laughs> because because it becomes a poor uh, insurance product. So. It turns out that uh, these kinds of standards and so on can be a good, uh, um, can, you know, can be a really good uh, enabling device uh, for um, cyber insurers, but to try and understand uh, what the private sector companies can do uh, so that uh, you encourage them uh, to sort of uh, offer cyber insurance. Now, uh, stepping back, if you are a private company, there are multiple things you can do. You can first you can engage in your own self-protection, right? So you can have intrusion detection systems, so on and so forth. You can have self-protection. You can have self-insurance, right? Uh, what do you mean by self-insurance? Uh, what do I mean by self-insurance is that you take some money, and you, your own money, and you put it aside, right? And you have a sort of like a rainy day fund. And, and say, hey, I'm going to sort of set aside some money uh, to deal with, um, you know, and that's called self-insurance. Uh, and, and, and then, of course, you have third-party insurance, right? Third-party insurance is that some insurance company, company comes along and offers you um, the uh, um, offers you third-party protection. And what, what sort of my work here tries to do is to understand the uh, sort of linkages between uh, some uh, self-insurance, self-protection, and, and third-party um, um, insurance, uh, and, and try to understand which ones are complements and which ones are substitutes. Uh, in addition, you have this sort of uh, uh, the whole problem in, in this area of, of where international law comes in, uh, because increasingly we're seeing um, uh, lots and lots of countries uh, are using this uh, 
cybersecurity problem um, as a way to try to sort of punch above their weight. <laughs> you know, the, the small little companies, the small little countries, they generally can't do anything. They, they don't have enough money for tanks and planes and so on, but they have enough smart people who can sit and hack. <laughs> right? So, 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 so they can create a lot of problems. Um, so, uh, so, so in the cyber insurance uh, project, what, 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 I'm, what I really would, am able to show, what I was able to show is that, in fact, cyber self-protection works really well with third-party insurers in the sense that they are uh, complements. Uh, what, what I mean by that is if I'm a private company, if I engage in self-protection, then that actually allows me to make the third-party insurance market work better. Because, because I'm able to show, hey, I have all of these systems in place and so on, so I'm a better risk, right? Or I'm a lower risk. So please give me a cyber insurance policy, right? Because I have all this self-protection in place. On the other hand, self-insurance and third-party cyber insurance are actually substitutes. So, so if I have, um, my, if I'm insuring myself with my own rainy day fund, then I don't want third-party insurance. The problem with that, of course, is that, that, that I don't have the risk share, right? I don't have, I'm not pooling the risk that a third-party insurance provider does, right? The third-party insurance provider can take all our um, premiums and so on. Uh, and and, and so, so, so self-insurance is probably sort of the, the most uh, um, undesirable way to go here. Uh, and, and so that's kind of what, uh, you know, what exactly do you do? Uh, to promote uh, uh, sort of uh, um, a vigorous cyber insurance market. Uh, and remember, this is a brand new market. We're sort of starting uh, from uh, nowhere, and there are these insurance products that are sort of uh, coming out. Uh, and, and most of them have uh, really large, big exclusions because they don't want to, they're worried about uh, uh, sort of, hey, I, I cannot have an infinite amount of liability exposure. So instead of having to sort of like you only show only up to certain things, so so uh, so so they have a lot of exclusions, but then they often have caps uh, on how much insurance they'll make. Right? So, so so cyber insurance is kind of an interesting uh, interesting area. Uh, I, I can talk to you more about it, but let me move on to this uh, second uh, sort of thing that I want to tell you about briefly, and that is information sharing. Information sharing has become a really big topic in the last six months. I'd actually written about it about a year and a half ago. Uh, and um, so the notion is really simple. The public sector has a lot of information about cybersecurity, right? Governments know a lot about, have a lot of classified information about who is doing all these attacks, where are these things coming from, um, so on and so forth. Uh, most of which is not available to the ordinary citizens and is not available to private firms. On the other hand, private firms have a lot of information that's not available to the government. Uh, why? Because the private firms are being attacked a lot. Uh, so, so, so they actually know, and, and private firms will tell you, and uh, in talking to them, they actually have developed all kinds of sophisticated ways of figuring out where these attacks are coming from. Um, uh, you, you know, for example, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, one of my, uh, uh, in, in one of the, the sort of the uh, um, discussions that I was having with one, with, with a company, uh, they, they were telling me they can always tell uh, the attacks from China. And I said, well, how can they tell the attack from China? Because they said, well, they have, those guys have different national holidays than everybody else. So we, we know we're going to say, the national holiday in China suddenly the attack stopped. And boom, 14 hours later, they're back at it. <laughs> you know, so, 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 you know, so. They said, we don't care if they throw Russian words in there. We don't believe them. <laughs> it's not a national holiday in, in, you know, in, in, uh, in, in Russia. It's a national holiday in China. Uh, so, so, you know, and so, so it's little things like that, but, but, but they actually, the private sector grows a lot about what's going on. And so, so the question becomes, how can they actually pool their um, resources? And how can they sort of do this in a way uh, that um, uh, is meaningful? And so the, the private sector, the concern is uh, that they have an awful lot of information about all of us. Um, and, and so we don't want all this information to go to the government. 
so is there a way to sort of develop anonymizing tools and so on that would allow some information to be shared with the government but doesn't involve personally identifiable information? Um, and, and, and similarly, uh, the public sector, uh, what kind of things that are not classified that can be shared with, uh, with, this, um, with the private sector? And so we came up with this idea of the circle of trust. So you're welcome to read our paper. I'm going to skip through the actual details. Uh, but, but, but the circle of trust um, is this framework that we have, we have developed um, that, that sort of talks about how e you can, in fact, keep these pieces of information out. And there's still a lot of information in the middle that can be shared by both the public and the public. And we sort of identify that and figure out how to do it. And, and we call it the circle of trust. Uh, and, and, and so, so um, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a detailed paper, but, but, but the notion here is simply that information sharing is really something that's critical. There's no way out, uh, because uh, the private sector has information that the government doesn't have, and the government has information the private sector doesn't have, and if you're going to have effective cybersecurity, uh, you really need to make these things work together. And so public-private partnerships at the highest level uh, are really critical. So that's, that's kind of the idea. Any questions? Any minutes? Okay, I'll keep going. Uh, I'll tell you the last uh, thing that we're working on, and then, and then we can take questions. Um, I just wanted to sort of, especially in a talk like this, uh, instead of going uh, you know, deep into any one of these topics, I want to sort of give you a flavor of the kinds of things we're working on. So then you may sort of different things into a different detail. So the last thing that we're focusing on is that, in fact, currently, there is a whole underground gray illegal market where you can go and find out what are the loopholes and what are the uh, vulnerabilities in a lot of the software packages that all of us use every day. So if you are a Cracker Jack programmer and you have developed uh, and you have found some other ability in, say, uh, Microsoft uh, PowerPoint, uh, you know, you now have something valuable that you can actually trade, that you can actually sell. And there are people who actually will pay for this stuff. And, 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 and so, you know, this, this sort of, uh, I mean, it's really, really interesting because uh, the uh, uh, software company, for example, Microsoft does have uh, a bug bounty. Uh, that's what they call it. Uh, it's not my words. Uh, so, so these bug bounty programs exist. These bug bounty programs don't pay much. But the gray market actually will pay a lot. Uh, and, and, and you even have uh, you know, uh, big cybersecurity jocks um, who, who actually then uh, who, you know, have this sort of informal um, uh, vulnerability, uh, vulnerability market exchange that connects buyers and sellers. And, and, and these people actually pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to each other uh, just to try to sort of, um, um, you know, make sure that these exploits, uh, that these vulnerabilities are patched uh, before they're exploited. So what our work suggests, and we've been sort of modeling this, it is to sort of say, well, hey, why not have an open legal market for vulnerabilities? It actually makes sense to have a, um, you know, to, to sort of, hey, you might say, instead of buying this underground, uh, there's actually, uh, it makes sense uh, to disclose the vulnerability uh, so it can be fixed. Uh, and to actually simply demand a market price for it, uh, and develop mechanisms to trade uh, on these uh, vulnerabilities, and under what circumstances could it work, and under what circumstances is it actually beneficial to keep it secret? Uh, and, and, and you know, and, and, and we urge uh, that in fact um, that the current approaches are lousy, uh, and, and we actually sort of uh, suggest that these markets should be legitimized, and we should actually make it an attractive investment vehicle. Uh, 
In other words, in, in, in other words, you have some spare money. Uh, go and buy the vulnerability from someone else. <laughs> pay that person, and then go and you turn around and sell that to Microsoft uh, and make more money. But at least the problem gets fixed. Uh, and, 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 and you know, the person who actually has the information gets, or a number of us gets the money. Uh, and, and instead of giving it to these people who are, um, you know, so 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 we sort of look at this. Uh, uh, closely, uh, and, and, and we, we argue that um, this is a situation where we should have um, uh, a rigorous market uh, in information that, that supports information sharing, uh, that, and that ultimately supports um, uh, the sharing of vulnerability information, because vulnerability, vulnerability information is just like any other kind of uh, commodity, and, and that it's a commodity market that can be traded uh, and, and you can actually have a very uh, uh, interesting discussion uh, on what is the future value uh, of a particular vulnerability. Uh, and you can actually facilitate uh, transactions between buyers and sellers. And you can have discussions about pred and predictions about uh, you know, how many of these vulnerability vulnerabilities are going to be out there, how many of them are going to be, uh, depending on the software package and so on, uh, you can actually have uh, um, Discussions and speculations uh, about uh, uh, security, security uh, markets. So I'll stop right here.